What's up, science lovers? I'm Alva, one of your cafe coordinators, and we're back with our February Teen Science Cafe presentation. We're excited you're here and ask you to be respectful during the presentation and save questions for the Q&A section. You can check out the Teen Science Cafe rally on t Facebook and Instagram. We'd love it if you followed us to st uh, stay up to date to more amazing cafes. You can also view our YouTube recordings of this Teen Science Cafe and past cafes on the museum's YouTube channel. Thank you. Alrighty, so my name is Talon, and as you probably already know, today is Groundhog Day. Our presenter is the research curator of mammalogy at the museum, Dr. Mike Cove, and he's an applied conservation ecologist and mammalogist, obviously, and he's here to share about groundhogs and then also just awesome animals that burrow. So speaking of groundhogs, Punxsutawney Phil did not see his shadow, which predicted in early spring. So please welcome Dr. Mike Cove to the stage. Hey, awesome, thank you. <clears throat> All right, thanks so much everyone for coming out today. Uh, I, this is my first Teen Science Cafe. Actually, I don't, this is my first in-person cafe session. I've done some on YouTube during uh, when, when we were all uh, stowing away at home uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, so thanks so much for coming out. I am going to be talking about all different types of mammals uh, with particular emphasis in some of our burrowing species. And uh, there's a little bit of interactive stuff and I have a, a whole bunch of specimens here uh, to show, to showcase and share with you. Um, the picture that I have on my title slide, that is uh, one of my favorite mammals. That's a Key Largo wood rat. They're not burrowers. Um, I'm gonna explain why I have them uh, in this presentation because I'll use any excuse to talk about wood rats um, in a little bit. But they are a rodent, and rodents are the, uh, the most speciose group of mammals. So uh, there's 6,500 species of mammals, right? 40% of those are rodents. And so those are all lots of small things that we often forget about. Uh, you know, we're typically only thinking about mice and rats, but there's so much diversity in rodents. And so I will be uh, touching on some of that. But just a little bit quick um, about who I am and, and what I do here at the museum. So I'm the curator of mammals. So I oversee our uh, research collection, our mammalogy uh, uh, specimens. And so we have over 28,000 uh, mammal specimens, two stories underground in the other building, and those are for research purposes. So those were collected with the intent to uh, better understand uh, biodiversity through time. Some of our uh, specimens date all the way back to the 1800s, and we preserve them, you know, hopefully into perpetuity. And so this is what that looks like downstairs. Uh, again, we are, we're two stories underground, so we are the literal and figurative foundation of this museum uh, and everything that we do here at the uh, Museum of Natural Sciences. And this is what that looks like inside of these um, uh, hermetically uh, uh, sealed cabinets. And uh, you can see there's just drawers and drawers of on the left rodents and on the right some of our other species, a larger species even including a, a red wolf there. And so these aren't taxidermy, these are uh, study specimen skins and they're uh, preserved in a way that, you know, they hopefully will exist into perpetuity. They're stored at uh, a climate controlled and uh, temperature controlled environment. And they're preserved in a way that we could fit as many as possible in those cabinets because we have a finite amount of space to store all of these for research purposes. Uh, a little bit about myself. I was asked to talk just uh, just real quickly about myself, just for all the all the students out there in the in, uh, in the audience, so you could think about you know if you like animals. Uh, everyone tells you to go, that your only option is to go to veterinary school and to become a veterinarian. And that's what everyone told me when I was a kid. Um, and, and I learned a lot along the way that that's not the only option if you love animals. So um, my undergraduate degree was in a bachelor's of science uh, in animal science from the University of Connecticut. We uh, 
are in the triangle of North Carolina. And I think we think of this as being kind of, uh, you know, the, the stage of, uh, of uh, NCAA basketball. Well, UConn Huskies are the number one country, uh, another one, number one team in the country. So I would say that uh, Stores, Connecticut is actually where basketball is really played. Uh, then I have a master's in biology from the University of Central Missouri. And then I moved here to North Carolina to get my PhD, uh, my doctorate in zoology at NC State. And along the way, I was a zookeeper. Uh, and then I, you know, trapped a whole lot of different animals. Uh, if anyone needs special tips and advice on how to uh, catch and sedate and, and restrain skunks without getting sprayed, please feel free to come talk to me after, um, <clears throat> after our presentation. So uh, here's a little bit of interactive question here. What is a groundhog? Is it A? Does it belong, the, I'm gonna name a few uh, different mammal families and you're gonna raise your hands. Is it A, uh, does it belong to the Suidae family, the pigs? Any, any hands? Is it B, Castoridae, the beaver family? Any hands? Right, get them up high there. A few in the back, okay. Is it C, Herpestidae, the meerkat family? Hands, okay. Is it D, Geomidae, the gopher family? Hands. Okay. Or is it E, Syuridae, the squirrel family? Hands. Raise them up, please, folks. Okay. So do we have a consensus vote here? It's actually uh, E, Syuridae, the squirrel family. Groundhogs are the largest of the squirrels. Uh, we have seven species of squirrels here in North Carolina. So we're gonna work our way through those too. So you have the, the state mammal there on the screen, what's that? The eastern gray squirrel, right? We have another one here. I'll, I'll pull it, I, this is big enough that I'll just hold up. This is, uh, what's that? Nope, not a ground squirrel. This is another tree squirrel from here in North Carolina, lives in the coastal plain. You might see them from Fayetteville South. Uh, this is a fox squirrel. This is an eastern fox squirrel. Uh, they have different patterns. They're quite a bit larger than gray squirrels, but they, um, what's fascinating about the fox squirrels is they live in the longleaf pine savannas that are fire-prone ecosystems, and they, uh, they end up having, if you look at the variation in their pelage, they have a lot more black uh, often throughout their uh, uh, fur patterns, and that helps them uh, camouflage in with the charred ground uh, after fires in the pine plantations and things like that. Uh, so that's two. We have uh, the red squirrels out in the mountains, North American red squirrels. Uh, then we have um, two flying squirrels. We have the southern flying squirrels that you might see here around Raleigh. And then uh, out in the west, in the mountains, you have the northern flying squirrels. Uh, anyone else? Oh, we got the six is the... Mammal of the hour themselves, the groundhog, right? Whistle pig, they call them sometimes. And, um, okay, one more squirrel. Does anyone have any other guesses? It's in this photo, if you could shout it out. Chipmunk, the eastern chipmunk is also a squirrel. Uh, you can see the chipmunk there uh, climbing on the uh, edge of the tree. So I, I will sh share that uh, a lot of what I do in, in terms of my research, while also while overseeing the mammal collection and our, and our research, um, uh, studying the biology, ecology, conservation of mammals using specimens and other museum uh, uh, data, um, we, I do also do a lot of field work in, in the field where we're deploying things, um, what we call non-invasive survey techniques or camera traps, kind of uh, hunting, hunting uh, cameras or game cameras as you will. And so we use those to, to study mammals a lot in the wild. And that is how we get a lot of our data nowadays uh, uh, for um, you know, being able to detect and monitor uh, mammal populations 
uh, across space, across you know the whole continental U.S., and through time by by um, you know capturing those photos and recapturing them. And so we don't always end up with as many specimens like this. Nowadays, we do a lot more opportunistic specimen collection. Um, you know, when when animals get hit by cars uh, and they're in good shape, we can preserve them in the collection. Um, but a lot of our data comes through things like this, through uh, camera traps. So here's one um, from a project that I actually did while I was working at the Smithsonian uh, in Washington, D.C. We did a wildlife survey in, in D.C., in, in the city proper, um, and we set up 1,600 camera traps uh, in alleys, behind dumpsters, uh, a lot of photos that we couldn't share. Um, and then we got, you know, really neat, fascinating pictures like this uh, groundhog here. Groundhogs, also known as woodchucks, whistle pigs. Um, any other names that I'm forgetting? Um, <clears throat> so the groundhog is the eastern species of, of a group of mammals uh, known as marmots, right? Marmots are, are the largest of the ground squirrels. And this is the largest mammal that hibernates. Uh, a lot of folks might be saying, well, you know, bears hibernate. And bears, bears are not true hibernators. They, there's, there's three traits of uh, hibernation. You have to, true hibernation. You have to lower your body temperature. You have to lower your metabolic rate. Uh, what's the other one? And you have to lower your temperature, lower your metabolic rate. And lower something else. Um, you're, you uh, Lower your temperature. Temp temperature, did I say temperature? Oh, heart rate, yeah. Yes, heart rate, that's it. Thank you, whoever said that. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. Boy, I forgot. Uh, yeah, it's Friday night, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so cool. So ground squirrels are, at, ground squirrels, which is what the uh, uh, woodchuck is, is actually the largest of the true hibernators. And so everything else uh, are, is smaller than that. So um, probably, you know, someone asked me, well, why do we focus on the groundhog as this species? We have a whole day for them. We focus on them seeing their shadows. Uh, think about what that means for you know, the future of, uh, of the spring and, and winter. And I think there's a, a few traits associated with the groundhogs that make them kind of the, the charismatic species for, for Groundhog's Day in particular. And the thing is, they, they disappear for, in some places, up to six months out of the year, they are underground. Now, they're not actually even the longest um, uh, hibernating species that is that in in North America probably goes to this animal. So I'm going to show it. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to scan it here. I think the screen should switch to this. This is another. Is this switching? Okay. Okay, cool. So this is a study skin. Um, again, you know, you could see that we have the uh, species name, where it was located, the size. Um, and this is a, uh, this was collected in, um, 1953, 13-lined ground squirrel. So this is a, another, uh, small, uh, ground squirrel. They can spend uh, up to, uh, nine months, uh, even 10 months underground in some of their, uh, range in, in the plains of, uh, Canada, the Great Plains of, of, of the northern U.S. and Canada. Um, okay, I think we're going to go back to the slide presentation, and I will keep going um, with our next stuff. But those those ground squirrels, the, the especially the thirteen line ground squirrels, get all the way. They lower their body temperatures all the way to basically thirty three degrees. Uh, so they're not actually frozen, but they get that low. All right. So um, an, another cool thing about uh, groundhogs and what they do, right? They create these burrows. 
their burrowing species, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. But first, we're gonna take a little detour. Remember I told you about my beloved Key Largo wood rats. This is the uh, ecosystem engineer that I would love to talk about, and I'm gonna introduce this term, uh, eco and ecosystem engineering, because the, the groundhogs dig burrows that create this network of, of tunnels and spaces for animals to go down underground and use. And the, the um, wood rats are a different type of ecosystem engineer where they build these giant stick nests. So you can see the picture on the right, uh, uh, a giant a pile of sticks. You can see a person in the background there. And what they do is, this is a small rodent. We, we actually have two species of wood rats here in North Carolina, uh, one in, uh, uh, two in the mountains and one on the coast. Um, the uh, the uh, Allegheny wood rat out in the mountains and the eastern wood rat and then the eastern wood rat uh, out on the coast. And what they do is they they pile all of these sticks into these giant, uh, think about it as almost like terrestrial beaver dams uh, or beaver lodges. And so that picture on the right was an experiment where we were studying how far do these wood rats collect these sticks to pile them up on their nests. And what we did was we painted sticks uh, in triplet color combinations. So every single stick had a different three, uh, three color combination and we laid those out in the environment and so we know where each each stick comes from in the environment and then the wood rats would go out and pick them up and pile them on their stick nests and we found that they actually like to decorate their nests and they're they're pack rats right they pick up cool things and they pile them on their nests and so we found that these small little rodents you know uh, uh, two to three hundred grams were carrying these sticks that were you know almost a uh, you know uh, 20, 20 inches, maybe a, a yard, uh, up to 50, 50 yards. So that's half a football field that they were carrying them. And this is what those uh, stick nests look like over time. They build these giant, giant stick nests, which is which is really cool stuff. And so that's just another um, component of animals that that change and or build their environment as engineers, and they create habitat for other species. Uh, other mammals will come use these nests. Uh, uh, different insects, different migratory birds will come forage at these nests, uh, forage the insects. Uh, reptiles, amphibians, um, and, and even in, in the case of these wood rats, we found that they had unique um, microbial communities living inside of them. And these microbial communities were uh, actually producing, uh, had antibiotic properties where we think that they have this symbiotic relationship with these microbes living in their uh, environment that, prev um, that prevents the uh, accumulation of pathogens in their environment. So they're, they're really neat species. But the key thing here of why those uh, stick nests in this case or the tunnels and burrows of the, of the burrowing species is that they, um, they are uh, climate controlled uh, by being underground or being deep in this um, uh, stick pile, stick mound, uh, uh, stick nest. They, um, they, they kind of stabilize the climate such that it stays cool when it's hot out and warm when it's cold out. And and they stabilize the humidity. And so we even see um, you know, differences and, and convergence in the fungal communities associated with those compared to the outside. Uh, here's another species that I've studied uh, fairly extensively. This is uh, the uh, beach mouse. So beach mice live uh, on the barrier islands down in the Gulf of uh, Mexico off the coast of Florida and Alabama. And they're one of the smaller burrowing species that I'm gonna showcase here. So here's a little beach mouse. There's a, the photo's a little blurry, but it, again, it's a camera trap photo. But you can see the beach mouse there facing off with a, a ghost crab on the beach. And so they dig pretty extensive um, tunnels and burrows. Uh, in the beach dunes, and so they actually create a lot of habitat um, uh, and and um, uh, facilitate the the seed dispersal and regeneration of dunes. I don't know. Oh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, it is there. So beach mice are fascinating because they have uh, they've evolved to blend in um, with the sand from predators and. 
you can see that they're they're quite small. Now, it's hard to do in you know it's hard to build a tunnel uh, in the beach, right? Sandy soil. Um, and so you can see that they benefit from being so small that they can build these tunnels that are small enough that they're able to persist and, and have extensive burrow networks. But you can't, you can't expect larger species like the woodchuck or a groundhog to burrow in the sandy soils. And so actually, if you look at the distribution map of the uh, eastern groundhog, um, it, it cuts off right around here, right around Raleigh, right? It, it, the distribution basically ends uh, between the, uh, the Piedmont and the coastal plain. And that's because the soil gets so sandy that they can't burrow, their burrows collapse. And what's interesting is they, uh, the groundhogs, uh, you know, other species, the, the chipmunks, groundhogs, and actually skunks. Basically, all, their distribution in North Carolina all ends right around here. But they do benefit from a lot of our infrastructure, like roads and highway medians, where we're bringing infill uh, in some of the areas in the coastal plain. So they have actually expanded in some areas, like um, you know, even in the Outer Banks down from uh, Virginia and other places like that. So. Are you familiar with the show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives? Anyway, yeah, okay, cool. Maybe most of the, a lot of the parents, none of the students, teens, okay, cool. Uh, so we're gonna go on a little adventure here. Uh, diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, triple, triple D. We're gonna do triple S. We're gonna do the spec, we're gonna go over the spectrum of subterranean specialization. So, and we have our pal uh, Guy Furry here to tour us around through um, some of the traits uh, and specializations of, of mammals that, that dig in that burrow. Okay, so first I wanna get over uh, three key terms here. Traits, homology, and convergence. So, traits are characteristics of animals that help them uh, adapt and uh, increase their fitness and or their survival, right? So uh, traits could be anything from how big this beaver's teeth are um, to you know how flat its tail is to how large its feet are, et cetera, et cetera, right? And all of those traits are um, are selected for. They have some kind of adaptive advantage that uh, eventually those traits can be can become more elaborate. Um, but rodents like this beaver have uh, have teeth, you know, big, giant, sharp teeth, and they're continuously growing. And so, in the case of the beaver, they have uh, they have to continuously gnaw, and all, all rodents do, in fact. And so, these are traits that we're going to be talking about uh, that are fall along a spectrum of uh, you know what are the best and worst traits, or or where's the variation in the traits um, for subterranean mammals come from. And so that brings us to our next uh, term here, homology. And so you have to remember that we have this uh, baseline structure in our, in our bones, um, in our morphology, that carries over where you will see variation uh, in, you know, you could see the, the humerus and radius and ulna, the different bones in those arms, and where, what they uh, morph and evolve into in other species like cats, bats, and whales. And then we have convergence here, where we're looking in this figure, um, species from uh, the uh, Central and, and South American uh, rainforest communities on the left. And on the right, you have uh, species from the Central African rainforest communities on the right. And what you could see is there's a convergence where we see different species, unrelated species, uh, converging on similar morphologies and shapes and sizes. And so, uh, you know, you have capybaras versus pygmy hippos, pacas versus dikers, uh, goodies versus other dikers, et cetera, or I guess those are shivertons maybe. Uh, and then you have at the bottom, giant armadillos and pangolins. And so we're gonna uh, look at those here shortly in a minute. 
But first, I want to think about what those traits are that we're going to look at that fall out on that spectrum. So um, can anyone think of a, a few traits that might help you dig burrows in the environment? Yeah. Muscular legs, yep, uh, that's a good one, yes. Claws, perfect, we got claws, okay. Uh, any others, well, yeah. Sharp teeth, let's see, I got teeth on there somewhere. Teeth, yep, perfect, yeah. Yeah, so that would fall under diet, body shape, morphology, differences in, in your paw structure. Um, physiology, how able you are to withstand different temperatures. Again, some of these species are hibernators. They're, they're lowering their body temperatures. And then um, sociality. So we're going to try to look at the variation across a few of these traits um, with some specimens and with some, uh, some figures to help. And I'm just going to confirm that, we, that I have plenty of time here, which I do. Um, and we will work through those traits to look at where, where specialization falls along that spectrum. So remember I said there's 6,500 species of mammals? That's what that tree looks like. And I'm going to show you all the different unrelated species groups that all exhibit burrowing, uh, burrowing and den building to some extent uh, within their families and orders. And so we'll try to get through a few of the kind of real cool case studies and, and we'll look at some specimens uh, here. But you know, you have uh, again that convergence where you have marsupial moles. Um, uh, typical moles, you have, uh, then you have a whole nother group at the bottom, the golden moles in Africa, uh, and a variety of other rodents, uh, insectivores, and um, boy, it's so hard to see from here. But basically, m many of the orders that we're thinking about will, will have some representative that burrows. Obviously, in the middle there, there's a big gap. Those are our ungulates. We don't really have any ungulates that burrow, save for the um, warthogs. But warthogs don't, don't typically um, dig their own burrows. They'll usually use other animals' burrows and extend them. So claws, let's think about claws. So we already kind of talked a little bit about the beach mouse there on the, on the far end of the spectrum, right? They have fairly small claws. They, they, you know, this is a small, tiny species. They don't need much to dig through sand, right? And then we have really big claws on the uh, other end of the spectrum there. <clears throat> Exhibited by this species. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah, pangolin, cool. So uh, pangolin is a fascinating species, you know, really, really exciting, cool species. Uh, a lot of folks know about them now, uh, unfor you know, m for unfortunate reasons, actually. That's because pangolins uh, in recent years have become known as the uh, most trafficked animal in the world. And that's because their scales are used in some uh, traditional medicines uh, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And so the interesting thing is that the scales themselves are actually just modified hair. So that's keratin, uh, that like our hair is made of, uh, and, and, and our fingernails. And so this is just modified hair that has basically become um, uh, shields of, of of fingernails. Uh, it's also, it's actually the same um, keratin material that makes up rhino horns as well. And so um, this is a, a, a species that some of them are, or, or some of the smaller ones actually have long prehensile tails and are uh, arboreal, live in the trees. But um, of the uh, eight species, actually, actually just a new species was discovered, ninth species, um, most of them are large like this one and uh, fossil or semi-fossorial. Now that's a new term I hadn't thrown out there. Fossorial means uh, living underground, spending time underground, going underground. And so look at the claws on that animal. Uh, you can see they have these giant claws for digging, but also for um, uh, consuming, consuming food. So they eat 
Um, they don't they don't have teeth. They eat um, ants and termites, and so they use those claws to dig out ant mounds and termite mounds uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and other uh, uh, Southeast Asia. I will show another one, another species here, um, to kind of tack on with the convergence theme. But you guys feel free to shout it out, yeah? Nine-banded armadillo, right? This is the armadillo species we have here in North Carolina, in a few counties out west. It's only a matter of time before they continue to expand. Um, but this is a species that is naturally expanding. Um, because of uh, warming climate. And so the, the main limiting factor in what limits armadillos from occurring in an area is the number of days uh, below freezing. Because they, they, and it's like, you know, basically uh, if, if there's fewer than uh, 10 to 15 days of frozen ground, uh, they can persist. Be, but they need, to, they need to dig and be able to burrow, uh, dig up, um, worms and, and other invertebrates and tubers and things like that. But they are also burrowers. And so you see that there's a lot, there's a ton of convergence. They look very, very similar to that pangolin I was holding up, right? They, they can ball up to protect themselves with their armor, uh, just like the pangolin can. They have those giant claws, they have a long tongue, they do have some teeth, um, but, but mostly they're eating softer stuff. Um, but the thing that's fascinating about the armadillo is this isn't their uh, um, hair at all. They actually do have very, very fine hair on their scales. This is actually dermal bone. So this is a bone, bony shell structure that uh, helps protect them. And, and um, I think probably at the end, I'll, I'll let folks up, come up to feel the, the armadillo and the pangolin, um, but, but none of the furry animals that we're looking at here. Okay, let's look more along the spectrum. So the, the other end of the spectrum, the structure of the burrows. So we have species that, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks think about uh, bears having dens or coyotes uh, in the photo. Um, other species, other canids, like the red fox, burrow, right? But really what they do is they have dens. They're not making burrows. And the difference between dens and burrows is that burrows are more extensive tunnel networks and usually have uh, some kind of structuring underground. And so, uh, so the spectrum there goes from things like that create dens, like the, uh, the, the coyote, the red fox, and then even this species. Does anyone know what this is? This is another canid. Fennec fox, yeah. So this is a fennec fox. Uh, this is a species from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and they're they're the smallest of the fox species. Um, but you know they have um, some cool adaptations to live in the desert. They have giant ears that help them thermoregulate and cool off, um, and and hear uh, bugs and things like that that are uh, some of their prey. But they spend a lot of time underground, um, but not quite burrowers. And then the other end of the spectrum, you have a species there. Does anyone know what that animal is in the picture? You never see them above ground. And we don't actually have any in North Carolina. So yeah, it's a gopher. So I'm going to show you. that. That's called a pocket gopher. Now, um, this is going to blow your mind. Uh, the reason they call them pocket gophers is because they have pockets uh, out, outside of their mouth, kind of in their cheeks here, and they fill those with dirt and soil and then carry it out and dump it out uh, from those pockets, right? So here's one of those pocket gophers, and if we could go to the um, camera here, I'm going to show you. So there's the animal, right? There's its big claws, and there are those pockets. Yeah, cool. Huh? Yes. Hamsters. Hamsters are burrowers. They have ch uh, they have uh, cheek pockets. Uh, chipmunks have cheek pockets. But the pocket gophers really go win the prize there in terms of kind of really cool uh, adaptation there. Okay. Next slide. <clears throat> so teeth. 
teeth, uh, different ends of the spectrum there. These are a few skulls from our collection. On the left, we have a mole, the skull of a mole. Um, so this is a fossorial species, right? They are insectivores. You could see, you know, if you, if you zoom in on those teeth, you could see they have tons of hyper sharp teeth. I don't have a, oh wait, maybe I do have a skull. Sorry, give me one sec. Is the, okay, so you can see up there still. Okay, perfect. So there you can see they have um, super sharp teeth. They're insectivores. They're eating worms. They're eating things even up to you know, the size of a frog. Um, and so they chomp those things and chew on them. They're not really using their teeth for any kind of burrowing because they have these giant um, forelimbs that they use to burrow, right? So is, was this up? Let's see here. So I want to, so I can zoom in on that skull and you can see those teeth. It looks like the, you know, teeth of a carnivore or something. And then here I want to show the pectoral girdle and what the, the homology of their arm looks like. And so you can see how strong that um, humerus is, right? Look at this humerus, and then there's the radius and ulna. And so they just have this hyper strong uh, pectoral girdle there, and they just use it, because they only have one motion, like this, right? And they just swim through the ground. Um, so they're not using their teeth. I have a, a star-nosed mole as well, another cool species here in North Carolina. but. Meanwhile, if you look at the other skull, if we could show the other skull again, that is the skull of a gopher. And remember, they use their teeth to burrow and, uh, um, and fill those cheek pouches. And so you could see that they have very, very robust front incisors. Um, but those teeth also vary with diet because, again, I said the moles don't use their teeth to dig. They're eating worms and insects. But the, uh, the rodents, the um, pocket gophers, use those teeth because they're consuming tubers and things like that. Uh, then we have body shape. So, you know, basically the largest, the, uh, the largest you could be and still burrow and not collapse your uh, burrows are probably this species here, the giant armadillo from um, South America. Uh, they can get up to, you know, uh, 100, almost 100 pounds. And then um, we have, but they're kind of round and robust. So they're on one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have this species, an endangered species here in North America. Does anyone know? Cl black-footed ferret. It's in the weasel family. Um, and they are long and tubular, and that helps them go in and move through tunnels um, because they're, you know, uh, slight and, and slinky through those tunnels. So that's an endangered species. Uh, black-footed ferrets uh, were extirpated from most of their range and then were uh, captive bred and reintroduced, and that's actually a, a huge a conservation success story uh, in, in many areas where they're reintroduced in the Western US. Uh, then morphology. So we have a few, a few specimens here. Uh, kangaroo rats from the Southwestern US. Um, so they, you can see that this animal has pretty large ears, pretty long hind limbs, pretty long tail. Um, robust body. That's because they they do burrow, but they they're only semi-fossorial. They spend uh, much more time above. They, not much more time, but they spend more time above ground relative to some of the other species. So they don't have you know reduced sizes of other um, appendages or uh, or. Um, characteristics like you see in the mole there where moles have you know they spend basically all their time underground they don't need to see uh, they have strong chemoreceptors in this the star nosed mole they use chemoreception with the uh, little fingers of their star nose and so they they don't really need eyes they don't really need to see anything and so they have a lot of reduced uh, structures in their morphology 
And then sociality. So um, the aardvark uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is is um, pretty solitary. They're they're a, you know a pretty robust large burrower. Um, and um, the meerkat on the right. And so meerkats are pretty social. Uh, they have these large family groups, Meerkat Manor, if you remember. And so they um, spend a little bit of time above above the surface. They spend quite a bit of time above the surface because they're out foraging, uh, collecting uh, things that they consume, snakes, insects, uh, other small mammals, things like that. Um, but they have extensive uh, family groups and networks uh, in their tunnels underground. Um, another species that's um, fairly social in North America would be prairie dogs. Uh, I don't have a prairie dog here, but I do realize I forgot one other cool species uh, here in North America that's also solitary. Um, Badger, North American badger, right? So look at those robust claws. I don't need the camera to zoom in on those. They have massive claws, um, but they're they're uh, they're not tubular, right? But they're but they're pretty flat to fit through tunnels. Um, they're robust burrowers, um, and and you know really neat kind of ferocious uh, species for the size. So uh, uh, really neat animal there. Okay. Um, are there any other... I think that's all of the specimens I have there. But, um, <clears throat> but on the extreme end of sociality, there's one animal that sits apart from their all, them all. And it's kind of like the, the most wild mammal to exist in terms of the extremes of all of those traits that we just talked about. And uh, Guy Furry's here to help us because the winner, and unfortunately I don't have a, a specimen of this species, and that's because they're not that easy to, to preserve, um, would be this. So naked mole rat, right? So this, this has got to be the most uh, wild, wildly adapted fossorial burrowing species um, from the Horn of Africa, right? They only live in, in a, a few countries there in the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, um, maybe into Kenya and Tanzania. And they are, uh, uh, they, they basically spend all of their time underground and they're basically an insect. Uh, and, and I'm going to explain that here. So these are a eusocial species. That's the most extreme type of sociality that you can get to. And that is what bees and ants are. Naked mole rats have queens that are the reproducers of the, of the colony, of the group. They have um, uh, other roles where there's worker naked mole rats and, um, and you know, other roles, like in beehives and ant colonies, and they just have this crazy division of labor and structure, uh, just like insects. And uh, a, a couple other kind of just totally unique things is they're the longest lived rodents. They can live up to 37 years. Um, and, and probably more. Um, you know, some of the other rodents that I had up here, the beach mouse, the wood rats, you know, e even the, the groundhog, uh, you know, live three, three to five years is a really long life. Uh, the next longest living animals are the African porcupines, and they're probably like maybe 25 years. So this is by and far the longest lived uh, uh, rodent. And they're, um, they're not even warm-blooded. They're, they're thermoconformers. They just kind of ride their body temperature the, as the ambient air. Um, they have some level of uh, controlling their, their temperatures, but, but they mostly just ride at, at whatever the air temperature is in their tunnels. And by the way, there's not that much air that gets down into their tunnels, and so they, uh, they 
hardly need to breathe. They have uh, super low oxygen needs, and they can persist in very, very anoxic, low oxygen systems for a long time. Um, naked mole rats are also uh, a unique species that's studied pretty extensively in cancer research because naked mole rats do not uh, get cancer. Uh, and there's still a lot of ongoing research in figuring out what drives that. Um, there are, you know, I've just tried to wrap my head around some of the scientific papers that explain why they don't get cancer, um, but it has to do with um, uh, genes that prevent their cells from continuing to divide once they hit other cells, and it, it, it's a whole interesting mechanism. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else cool about naked mole rats. I mean, look at the thing, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. Um, they hardly come above ground. Uh, yeah, they're, they're just a, a really cool, oh, another thing. They don't have pain receptors in their skin, so uh, they don't feel pain. Um, I, I just, it's, they're, it's just like, this is such a bizarre, interesting species. And, um, and that's why they're kind of the coolest uh, a fossorial burrowing species. And I, I think we should have a naked mole rat day instead of a groundhog's day. Uh, uh, and I will be petitioning for that. So um, with that, I've got specimens up here. I'm, I'm ready. I have uh, plenty of time for questions, and I'd love to chat with you all about uh, more about mammals and, and groundhogs and whatever else you'd like to talk about. General mammal stuff, too. Okay, thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Cove. Uh, now it's time for Q&A. Uh, raise your hand and look for the cafe coordinator volunteers in purple shirts like this one, and they'll bring a microphone to you. It's really important that you speak into the microphone be for both our guests in the cafe and online to hear you. And yeah. So two naked mobat questions. One, so you said they are thermal confirmers. Does that mean they're ectoderms or is it a different category? Uh, they, they are s sort of more like ectotherms, yeah, like reptiles and, and amphibians or something. They, they're not technically ectotherms, but they're more similar to that. And what makes them so difficult to preserve? Oh, they, they, uh, just their skin is uh, uh, kind of delicate when it dries. Yeah, so you know, these are protected with their hair, um, and their skin, their skin uh, absorbs the oils and stuff like that, so you can't really touch them and everything. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, and this is fascinating stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you. So I feel like I missed the difference between a burrowing and a and a animal who has a den. Uh -huh. I don't know if my mind just wandered for a second there. No, maybe I didn't explain and, it well enough. You know, so do rabbits or rabbits burrowing? And then my second question is how vulnerable are these species being underground you don't have as much you know chance to get away from something so are there any examples of this is a great defense mechanism or does it is it really kind of a weakness or a disadvantage for most of the species that are burrowing yeah Thank sure that, that's a great question um, do I have to repeat the question I think it's okay because they had a microphone yep perfect okay cool so um, kind of the advantages and disadvantages of burrowing versus denning and, and some of the descriptions and, and differences. So, so dens are just more simple structure. And, and you know, basically m most mammals have the capacity to dig and try to you know, create a space underneath the ground. Many of them don't or take advantage of other animals burrows. And so that's what makes them kind of more ecosystem engineers and more important because a lot of other animals will, will um, you know, in some cases like coyotes, for example, will eat the groundhog and then take its burrow, dig it out a little bit and create their den for raising their uh, pups. Um, the thing with burrowing species is that it's more extensive of a network. Um, and more structure underneath. And so they will have multiple holes. 
in many cases. So uh, there are some species like red foxes will make a den and they'll have a few holes. Um, but many, many animals that have dens are usually larger and mostly have like one way in, one way out. But think of that as more like our carnivores, some of our larger carnivores and things like that. Um, but, you know, prairie dog towns or meerkat towns or... A naked, the naked mole rats or, or gophers will have tons of different holes that they're coming in and out of. Um, and so, so, so to escape predators or even to escape things like floods or whatever, they usually have multiple escape routes. And so uh, I actually, when I was in grad school in Missouri, I helped a, a lab mate that was studying Franklin's ground squirrels. And um, what what you would do is you would go to the uh, to go to the um, the burrows, and you would put a trap at the. You would basically plug every hole with a trap, and then pour water into one of the other holes, and all of the uh, ground squirrels would run out into the traps, and that's how you would get them to fit like little radio collars on them. Uh, and the, the water dissipates pretty quick. It's not like we drowned them or anything, but that that's an easy way to get them to come out. Um, other burrowing species that are kind of keystone species, ecosystem engineers, that are in the southeastern U.S. would be things like um, gopher tortoises are, are important ones that create these deep burrows uh, that other species, uh, all different types of rattlesnakes use, things like that. Uh, did I answer your question? I'm trying to think if there's any other component of it. Cool, yeah, thanks. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk more about the queens of the naked mole rat groups. Uh -huh. uh, like, how physically, I know with uh, insects, usually the queen looks very different. How different are they physically from the other naked mole rats? And also, uh, you compared them to lots of insects and colonies. The uh, like queen of insect colonies can have like hundreds of children like very very quickly how many children do they have at a time normally yeah okay cool great questions for a naked mole rat expert uh maybe not for me oh. but no no <laughs> i'm just joking no 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 i i can answer um <clears throat> so they're quite a bit larger that you could see that the, i mean they'll they're the if you've seen them in captivity you could you know, I, they have them at the National Zoo. A few other zoos have them. But so the, the queens have a, you know, really robust abdomen, and they're almost always pregnant. Um, and so they're not having giant litters uh, like anything crazy like insects would, um, kind of like running the same sort of fecundity or, or reproductive output of other rodents. So, you know, they have maybe five to 10 uh, offspring at a time or something like that. Um, but, but she does have that cycling where she's almost always uh, reproducing and, and she's really the only one for that um, colony that would be reproducing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, my, my question was, what is the largest prehistoric burrower? <laughs> oh, that would be a great question for a paleontologist. Uh, I, I think the, um, the giant uh, armadillos, um, the glyptodons, yeah, would probably, I, I, I believe that they burrowed. Yeah, I don't know. You, you felt like. I was thinking maybe giant sloths, or did they, I don't know if they burrowed or if they just like made like yeah. a tunnel. Yeah, they they dig. I don't know if it, it. I think it's like getting into the verbiage of what qualifies as a burrow at that so, point. So, uh, dinning versus burrowing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions. We actually have a question from the chat here. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, So our question in the chat is, do you study other mammal species besides ones in North Carolina? And they were thinking about national and international mammal species. Cool. Um, yeah, I have the luxury of getting to study all different types of mammals. So I've done work um, 
uh, again, like I, I spoke about the, the wood rats that I work with are in the Florida Keys. Uh, I, I do research in Central America, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, I've done work with, um, helped with work in South America, um, some in Asia as well. So I kind of have the luxury and ability to travel and try to get my hands on and see all different types of mammals all over the world. So I, I focus a lot on a, a whole bunch of North, um, North Carolina mammals, but I do get to travel and that's one of the beauties of being kind of an international uh, uh, museum in scope that, that we get to do that. Uh, so what about burrowing in non-placenta mammals? I think I know wombats burrow, but I thought some wombats are bigger than the giant armadillo, but you said, the, so just talk about that. Yeah, 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 please. great questions. Uh, so non-placental mammals would be your um, uh, marsupials and monotremes, uh, which do have quite a few burrowers. Wombats uh, are still a little bit smaller than giant armadillos. Uh, they're probably a little smaller than aardvarks as well. Um, there are a few um, uh, marsupials, uh, marsupial moles that are interesting that just totally converged on um, the the the, the uh, insectivorous moles that we have in North America. Um, you know, just even just holding this mole, I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this thing. So. Their, those forelimbs are you know, really strong and robust, but then look, they have these dinky legs that they basically just drag behind them when they're you know, swimming through the soil. Hey, so going back to what you said at the very beginning about uh, your collection two stories down uh -huh. um, and how they're not taxidermied but they're preserved yeah i was just curious how they're preserved because it didn't look like they were like floating in formaldehyde or anything right no no, no. so so how are they preserved yeah and then how are people able to study them like they're obviously not cutting into something from the 1800s mm -hmm. um but like what type of studies are done on animals that are that old sure yeah, yeah yeah great question um okay so uh what we do when we prepare these is they are just dried they are just air dried um we don't preserve them with any chemicals any treatments um a lot of taxidermy they would tan the hides with chemicals and things like that um we are just drying them um they you you could see they're um, stuffed with cotton and sewed shut, uh, and we dry them and then keep them in cabinets that are sealed, uh, climate controlled, humidity controlled, and that's and you know light is a big thing that also deteriorates them, so they're closed in those cabinets. Um, and the research that's done, this was you know before we had the camera traps and everyone had phones on uh, cameras on their phones and everything like that. This was how we documented the distributions of species, where where they lived and where they didn't, was through museum collections. Um, nowadays, it is really cool what we use museum collections for. That I you know when folks like Darwin were collecting these. Uh, specimens, they had no idea we'd be doing this type of research with them. Um, so just a few examples, I'm trying to think of what would be the most relevant cool ones. Um, so uh, we have uh, researchers, we, we, we recently had um, researchers come look from Duke, uh, come look at some of our specimens of uh, house mice. Um, and they were CT scanning their skeletons, and they were looking at the bone densities in their skeletons, and it was for osteoporosis research. And so, um, you know, house mice are the most common laboratory animal for all of modern medicine, right? That's where all modern medicine research uh, is focused. And all of those uh, laboratory mice are, you know, bred 
in these sterile environments where they're never exposed to any pathogens, bacteria, diseases, or anything. And a lot of the, uh, osteo the osteoporosis research that they were doing was looking at the influence of uh, pathogen exposure early on in, in adolescence, um, influencing your bone density and your, your, the trajectory of your bone density later on in life and how that influences your susceptibility to osteoporosis later. And they don't have that in laboratories. So, because all of these uh, mice are, are you know, c contained in sealed enclosures and not exposed to any bacteria. So they were using our wild collected house mice to CT scan to look at those bone densities. Um, other, other things, we, we do allow destructive sampling of specimens. Um, now, that's, that's up to myself and the other folks in the mammal unit to decide. People have to present a proposal if they want to do destructive sampling. Um, and, and it has to be you know, valid research and, and worthwhile uh, research to warrant some kind of destruction. But, um, but some things that can be done, um, you know, in, in a lot of cases when folks want to you know, take bone samples or, or cut, cut limbs or things like that, the, be, the good thing about that is that we have two of most of everything. And so they can cut you know, one. We have um, some researchers from High Point looking at uh, femurs. Uh, in a bunch of rodents, and, and we are allowing them to cut um, those femurs because they have one intact femur. Um, typically, a research specimen uh, that we preserve has the, the entire skin like this. Then we preserve its entire skeleton. Uh, we have the, the skeletons are cleaned by beetles. You can see the beetles upstairs um, cleaning skeletons. And then we also preserve um, uh, we have an ultra cold collection where we preserve tissues. We preserve their heart, liver, kidney, and muscle tissue. And so those are preserved in a, a negative 80 uh, freezer. And those are used all the time by folks. And that's, those are um, used for genetic analyses. They're used for uh, parasite and pathogen screening. Um, they're used for tox uh, toxicology research, looking at um, the levels of uh, toxic toxins in the in the liver, for example. Um, they're used for disease uh, disease screening. I said um, all different types of things. Uh, we also um, there's. You know, we look at um, patterns in the pelage, variation in the pelage. There's actually a lot of work that I've been doing with my graduate students where we're um, collecting hair from specimens. And there's the saying, you are what you eat. You can actually take uh, samples from the hairs of these animals and look at their um, stable isotopes, the, the uh, molecules, um, uh, carbon and nitrogen stable isotopes. And you could actually estimate what these animals were eating, you know, um, decades ago, even a hundred years ago, compared to contemporary animals, where you're pulling their hair and looking at those isotopes. So all different types of cool stuff, all different types of, you know, meta barcoding and genetics work now. And so it's really, really fascinating stuff what we get to do. Um, and and I see lots of cool proposals for expanding the use of museum collections to be, to better inform conservation and, and management and um, in the face of you know a changing planet. All right. Any more questions? Okay. I think we might only have time for one more question, but I don't know if you'll be available afterwards. Yeah, I, I've got a minute. Yeah, if anyone wants to come. So I have a question about naked mole rats. Yeah. So. A while ago, I read about them, and I heard that they can apparently move their two front teeth. Uh -huh. Is that true? Um, so they, so the thing about naked mole rats is um, their teeth actually come out th uh, um, through their lips, right? They're above their lip and below their lip. And so they can keep their mouth sealed shut while you, um, moving their teeth to, to remove dirt and stuff and not get dirt in their mouths. Um, I don't know to what extent they can move their teeth. Um, that I'm not sure because that I'm not sure because uh, that doesn't sound in physiology. That doesn't seem like something you'd be able to manipulate too much when they're when your incisors are set like that. But I will look into that because that's an interesting uh, question. So um, yeah, thanks so much again for coming out and. Uh, We'll see you next time. Thanks.
Thank you again, Dr. Mike Cove. Can we give him a round of applause? Um, and thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk and learned something new tonight. Thank you to the museum's digital media team for assisting with the presentation and to the Daily Planet Cafe staff for hosting us. If you enjoyed this presentation, you can find archived content from the previous Teen Science Cafes on the museum's YouTube channel. And this presentation will be on there soon. We invite you back on Friday, March 1st for our next presentation on minds and machines and AI applications within biotech. Mark your calendars. And that's all we have for you tonight. Um, can you, if you would like to see more content from the museum, follow us on social media. Um, and lastly, don't forget to fill out the cafe survey because your feedback matters and you'll get a piece of candy for completing it. My name is Ria and these have been your cafe coordinators. Thank you.